Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. We'd like to thank attendees from the OCLC RLP for their continued support and input into our work, as these are crucial to our success. We extend a warm welcome to our colleagues from Searle and from the Independent Research Libraries Association. Thanks for joining us today. Um, and today during our session, we'd like to invite everyone's participation via a few poll questions. The first question is ready for your responses. You can open up a browser window on your computer or phone and go to the link which is, uh, has been shared in chat, oc.lc slash polling. And now I'm delighted to welcome Marion Lefferts of Searle and Shayla Scott Weber of the OCLC RLP who will speak briefly. And then our presenter, Kendra Morgan, will share research from the Realm Project. So Marion, why don't you kick things off for us? Thank you very much, Mercy. Um, welcome all to this um, session of, uh, that is co-hosted by Searle and by OCLC. Uh, Mercy, I'm unable to uh, move the slides, I think. Oh, there we are. So here's my face. My name is Marianne Lefferts. I'm the Executive Manager at SEL. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with SEL, um, I'm listing here some of the databases that we are responsible for and that you might know, and the HPB databases for bibliographical records for early printed books. The SEL thesaurus records variants for place names and imprint names and for owners. We used to have a portal for accessing manuscripts and early, print book, early printed books materials online, uh, but it was underused, so therefore closed and replaced by the different surface. If you are unable to identify provenance mark, um, there was a Can You Help database, which is now included. In the database that you see at the bottom of the list, the SOIL Provenance Digital Archive. We are um, working very hard on expanding the material evidence in Incunabula database, which records provenance information for incunables. And in certain circumstances, we are able to host databases related to early printed materials and manuscripts. We are a membership organization, and we do not only connect data, but we also connect humans. We do that through our various meetings and through a large number of working groups, which are open for SEL members to join. Uh, some of our, them are about our products, the HPB, the SEL thesaurus, but we also have a working group on engagement and promotion, one on provenance, digital humanities, book binding, and there is a security network working group. And they were the group that initiated this uh, request for a session about the Brown project. We are about to launch a new working group which will focus on cultural property. If you want to have more on SEL and more news from us or from our members, then you can go to our website, www.sil.org. Uh, we publish regular blog posts. There is a mailing list. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter. After the session this week on the Realm project, next week at the same time, we will have a security network panel on the impact of COVID on special collections and our libraries. It will be like a water cooler communicate, uh, water cooler um, chat amongst uh, some of our key players in the SIL membership. And of course, there will be room for questions. Um, It'd be lovely to see you at a, a variety of our events, and I look forward to this session and this presentation. I hand you over to Merrilee, who has the outcome of the first polling. Find my unmute button. We're, at, we're inviting people, as we've been putting into chat, to share with us uh, where they are joining from today. Um, as you can see, if you haven't had a chance to take the poll, um, it is oc.lc slash polling. Um, and you can drop a push pin in our map. And as you can see, we are uh, humans all connected together by our interest in this very uh, important topic today and people joining from, um, from, from all over the globe. We'll be using this, uh, this URL to do a couple of other polls to collect information uh, so that we can 
know who's here and uh, what our uh, collective intelligence is. So keep that handy and we'll come back to this later. Uh, I'm going to turn things back over um, to, I think it's Shayla next. It is. Thanks, Marley. <clears throat> Uh, good morning from the West Coast of the United States. Um, I am Chayla Scott Weber. I'm a senior program officer for the OCLC Research Library Partnership, uh, where my work focuses on research at, for and engagement with the archives and special collections community. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly this morning to tell you just a little bit more about the Research Library Partnership if you are not familiar with it. Um, so we are uh, an international network of over 130 research libraries with members from the U.S., Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, um, the Middle East, and Asia. We are supported by the dues of our members along with a significant co-investment from OCLC as part of their overall research program and service to libraries. Um, and along with my fellow program officers, we work to create engagement and learning and research experiences to support libraries in sharing and creating knowledge um, so that they can meet the challenges of the 21st century research library and, and plan with confidence. Um, we support learning and engagement in four main program areas. Um, we offer our partners things like webinars, like today, uh, facilitated discussions, ongoing interest groups, and more focused and time-bound working groups. Um, as well as research projects that res as, uh, that respond to the needs that we hear about from the RLP community. Um, we work in next generation metadata, supporting libraries in making their metadata work harder and smarter, and work in things like linked data and collaborating around other topics related to metadata management. Um, through our shares, uh, Resource sharing arm of the RLP, we work in resource sharing and special collections. It's a generous resource sharing program that provides access to our member library's strong, rich, and diverse collections, um, and also supports active collaboration to innovate and support best practices for research resource sharing. Um, we also support research management, uh, working in areas like research data management and research information management. Um, and of course, unique and distinctive collections, um, helping libraries address the unique needs of archives, rare books, and special collections. Um, I'll put two links into the chat for our blog and our website, where you can learn more about our work. Um, in terms of archives, special and distinctive collections, we have a really long history of working in this area. In research libraries, we, we work in special collections because we understand that they're a really important site of knowledge creation and that that is made possible by the library's commitment to the stewardship of these collections. Um, we work to identify areas of common need and patterns of innovation that can help libraries scale up their learning and expertise with these kinds of collections. Um, and recent work in this area has looked at born digital archives, audiovisual collections, um, appraisal and uh, advocacy needs in special collections. So today we're really pleased to be presenting uh, a uh, special collections focused look at OCLC's research work with the Realm Project, and we're really happy to have you all here today. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Marilee for another poll. Thanks, Chayla. Um, so we have a second poll open at oc.lc slash polling. Um, and we're just asking people to take a moment uh, to let us know um, who's who's in the room. Uh, what What is your level of familiarity with the Realm research? Um, if you are familiar with it, how are you using it? Uh, it's great to see that we have um, Let's see, it's uh, moving around a lot, but, but a number of you are not familiar with the research and you are in the perfect place. You are right on time to be finding out about this. We also have a substantial number of people who um, have already implemented aspects of the research. And it's really uh, wonderful to see that. 
Uh, so I look forward to um, to hearing uh, some some wisdom from those of you who are in the room. I'm going to leave this poll open for uh, just a couple more minutes so that we can capture um, who's here and uh, keep that, but I'm going to turn it back over for the presentation. We're going to use this uh, polling tool one more time, so don't close that window quite yet. Uh, it'll switch over to the next poll as soon as I uh, open that one up. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Marilee. Hi, everyone. My name is Kendra Morgan, and I am a senior program manager here at OCLC. Uh, I am working on the Realm project, and uh, my other responsibilities here at OCLC include uh, helping to support our continuing education service called Web Junction. Um, that is a freely available service. We encourage you to check out. Um, it helps to connect library staff with the knowledge, skills, and resources that they need to help power the libraries in their community. And we appreciate all the work that you are doing in terms of helping to support your community through the COVID-19 pandemic. And the Realm Project is really designed to help answer some questions about how long COVID-19 can last on materials that are commonly found in libraries, archives, and museums. And this is a partnership of three organizations. So the Institute of Museum and Library Services is the funder of this project. Uh, its mission uh, in the United States is to advance, support, and empower America's museums, libraries, and related organizations through grant making, through research, and policy development. And they are the primary source of federal support for US libraries and museums here. So IMLS uh, catalyzed the research partnership and are involved in an ongoing role uh, to consult on the project goals and activities. And they also convene a steering committee that helps to advise the project as well as two working groups. So we have a scientific working group and an operations working group. And what's great about these committees is that they are represented by frontline staff in the field, library, museum, and archive staff um, who are helping to inform us every step of the way um, as we seek to uh, confirm the direction of the project. The second organization is Battelle, and Battelle is a scientific research institute, which is headquarters uh, in Columbus, Ohio, so very close to uh, OCLC. And they have done research in public health, consumer, industrial, and national security sectors. And they have an extensive history doing research on emerging and infectious diseases. OCLC was brought into the project to lead and manage the execution of the project deliverables. So we are coordinating Battelle's scientific research and we collect and synthesize the input from the working groups and steering committee that I mentioned, as well as from other subject matter experts in the collective fields. So we have established a cross-sector communication network that has dozens of associations and organizations that support libraries, archives, and museums, and they get the information from the project and pass it along to their constituents and likewise bring information back to us. And the final task that we have on this project is to distribute the research and information coming out of the projects to our constituent communities. And it's great to be able to be here today and, and share this information with you. Uh, many of you mentioned that you weren't yet aware of the research, so we're hoping to provide you with a good background. And then for those of you who have been aware of what's happening, uh, to give you a little insight into um, some of the new resources that are available and how you might be able to use them. So there are several key activities for this project, and I'll speak to each as we go through the session. Um, the first is to conduct literature reviews of published science to see what is emerging about COVID-19 that can be applicable to the libraries, archives, and museums communities. We're also continuing, continuing to engage with subject matter experts in the field. 
And this all informs the project planning processes, the laboratory testing of materials, which is really a key deliverable for this project and one that was of very high interest uh, to the library archives and museums community here in the United States. So we're taking all of the inputs and the test results uh, and synthesizing them into what we are calling a toolkit resources. And these are resources that apply the science uh, to the real world practices and operations of our organizations. And like the project research, uh, these are published as they are available and we learn more about the needs of the project. So we are um, continually releasing test results, uh, the literature reviews, everything is coming out as they are available. So the, you'll notice that um, I would say we have a, a, a large release about every month, um, sometimes smaller items to share every couple of weeks. So it's a constant uh, release of information and new resources. So we're going to move on to another poll. And uh, the link to the poll, again, is in the uh, chat. So it's just oc.lc slash polling. And we'd like to know a little bit about the current state of facilities operations at your organization. So are you open to staff in the public? Are you open to staff only? Have you not been able to resume operations at all? Um, and Marilee is going to uh, share those results with us as they come in. And one of the things that we are certainly finding is that this has changed over time. Uh, when we first started doing some work on this in the spring, um, a lot of organizations had been closed. We saw a phase of reopening, and as we've experienced a resurgence of cases, a lot of facilities have gone back to being partially opened. Uh, so we see here uh, just about 4% of the facilities are not open to either public or staff at this point, but 46% of you uh, have facilities that are partially open, limited services, and or programs. And a few, like a, oh, we've got about 14% that are fully open to visitors and patrons. And a lot of this, and it's really important to contextualize, has to do with you know, what's happening in your local community. Um, in the United States, for example, some areas where we're having higher infection rates, they may have had to roll back and aren't open, but if you're in a community that has um, more stabilized and isn't seeing as many cases of COVID, um, your rules may look very different. And that's one of the things that we are finding to be very key with all of the realm activities is the importance of local decision making. Uh, so really we are providing information to help with that and to allow people to apply that to their own local decisions. But because we're talking about so many communities with such different circumstances, we really do encourage people to look at the results of the research and apply them locally. All right, so just reinforcing um, what I was just mentioning uh, is that the Realm Project is, um, it's scoped to provide information to better understand the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So that's the virus which causes COVID-19 uh, with the goal of informing local decision-making in the development of operational practices and policies. One of the things that has been abundantly clear is the enormous amount of strain that some of these decisions and operations take on staff um, and that it puts your organizations under. And we are listening to that feedback and adapting along the way. But we want to really acknowledge that it is, it is just truly a human trait. Like we want to know um, more. Uh, we want more information right now than is really available. Um, and many people are just looking at the best ways to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and how it applies to our organizations and how we can keep uh, the staff, the public, um, and our physical buildings and collections um, free from contributing to spread. So 
With that in mind, though, it's important to note that Realm is not making recommendations. With all of that variability I mentioned among our institutions, everyone needs to develop their own policies that work with their local needs, conform to any uh, state, local, regional, provincial laws that may be in place um, in terms of providing access, and using the Realm data as one of the points of information. I wanted to talk a little bit about the status of the COVID-19 research. I think it's, uh, at this point, it's pretty impossible, certainly here in the United States, to turn on the news or to look at a website without there being information about new research that's happening into this uh, really important topic. Um, but of course, we were very interested in understanding how the research that's been released relates to public libraries, academic libraries, special libraries, um, museums, archives, the types of facilities that the Realm Project is targeting. So when we started the project, the very first literature review uh, got underway in May and June of this year, and it was focused on the public libraries. Uh, because we saw that as being one of the primary uh, institutions that were going to be um, expected in the community to open the quickest, they had lots of materials that were out uh, in the public that were going to be returned. And so we targeted the questions to public libraries, but it turned out that in looking at the research, there was very little published at that point that was really applicable to a specific type of institution outside of, of healthcare and in many cases, the travel industry. Um, I think because so many cases were impacting um, cruise ships, that was certainly impacting some of the research that was coming out. But what we were able to do then was to take the focus off of just public libraries in that first literature review and expand it to really look at some of the things that may impact all of our core institutions. And um, the three questions that we were focusing on was how the virus might spread through general operations, how long it survives on surface uh, before dying off naturally. That's often referred to uh, in the scientific research as environmental attenuation. And then how effective prevention and decontamination measures would be. Uh, so that could be cleaning agents, wearing personal protective equipment or PPE, things like masks and shields. So we were able to complete a first literature review, which was released in June, and this was conducted by the scientists at Patel. And then a second literature review uh, did a gap analysis from the time that we started the first literature review through to the middle of August, and that was released in October. So before I dive into some of the results, um, we want to surface a few things that are still unknown. And this certainly comes through as you're looking through the research for the project. But we want to call attention to it because it really should be part of the conversation that you have in your community as you're making decisions because it impacts what we know, and a lot of times what we know is how we inform our decisions. But what is unknown about COVID-19 is how many virus cells an infected person will leave behind on an object through coughing or sneezing. So we don't know, and that varies for, for certain, depending on how infectious that individual was at the moment, how big of a sneeze they might have. Um, I've certainly had to have some uh, little bit of a bodily fluid discussions <laughs> with the realm as we talk about things like sneezing and coughing and the impact that that has on leaving behind um, virus cells on materials. The second is how many virus cells someone can pick up from an object. So if I cough or sneeze on a book, and then I leave it in the book drop and a staff member then processes it and handles it, can they and how many virus cells would be transferred to that individual? 
And the third unknown item is how many virus cells are needed to cause infection. And this is a, a really big topic as well, because we don't know how much exposure you need to have in order to, um, to become infected. And with individuals, this could vary greatly, right? Our immune systems are all different. So there are just so many variables. Um, this is a relatively new pandemic. Uh, it's going to take a lot of time and effort to be able to answer some of these questions. But sharing these unknowns with your stakeholders, including staff, can be helpful in setting the stage to understand why policies and procedures may need to change. We are continuing to learn as a global community and we'll need to adapt as more information becomes available. So I wanna point out some of the key findings in the literature reviews. And the first is just emphasizing that last point is that the human infectious dose um, for COVID-19 is still unknown. There's been studies of many other viruses over the years, and there can be a wide range of infection levels, anywhere from several hundred virus cells up to a thousand or so. So, and again, it varies so much. And you can imagine how very difficult this is to be able to study the infection rates. You're either exposing someone to something that could potentially be deadly, um, which uh, represents all kinds of issues, or you don't have a controlled environment where you can actually specify that amount. Uh, other areas that require more exploration are aerosol particle transmission and human matter, either in solid or aerosols, and environmental factors such as humidity, temperature, ventilation and airflow, as well as air conditioning may also affect the spread of SARS-CoV-2. So when it, we look at how the virus spreads, the most likely types of spread are through direct contact between people and droplets pass between people. And this is the driving reason for encouraging people to wear masks and to maintain physical distance, right? We're encouraging people two meters, six feet apart, so that they um, reduce the risk of passing along infected droplets. Other possibilities do include aerosolized particles, a contaminated object. So once a, an object has viral matter on it, it's called a fomite. And so if we have books or museum materials, anything in, even in your special collections, um, if it has viral material on it, it's often referred to as a fomite in the scientific literature. And then other bodily fluids and excretions are also all popular uh, or possible. But again, most likely is that direct contact. But in our institutions where we're processing so many materials and often coming in contact with so many people, Thinking through other possible scenarios and how to mitigate any potential spread is an important activity for your organization. Things like temperature, relative humidity, air quality and airflow are also potential environmental uh, factors. Um, we know that heat, <clears throat> like a high heat, uh, over 30 degrees Celsius, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, does have an, an impact on the attenuation rate, so how quickly the virus dies off, and that cold temperatures seem to prolong the life of the virus. So for those of us who are moving into winter, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, um, that's a real concern now. Um, we're both moving inside as temperatures are cooler and the virus is likely to linger longer um, outside. But scientists are still looking into issues of air quality and airflow. So putting in different types of filters, for example, on their heating and ventilation systems to see if that helps to mitigate spread and exposure. 
Um, so there's a lot that people are still looking at, and this will continue to be a focus for the project uh, in researching the published literature. So tactics that show efficacy in prevention and decontamination uh, include um, hand washing and hand sanitizing. I think certainly here in the U.S., uh, we had a lot of encouragement very early on uh, for people to keep washing their hands, avoid touching their faces. Um, but other things that have been popular, of course, that social or physical distancing, wearing masks, spending time uh, in fresh air and open spaces, which in densely populated cities can be a real challenge, particularly if we look in apartment buildings or dense office spaces. Um, other uh, topics that are particular interest to our communities are surface cleaners and disinfectants and the impact that they might have on our collections. So if, um, for example, paper-based collections are not going to be uh, amenable to a, a liquid disinfectant, um, but neither is something like a high heat because it causes damage to book bindings, uh, it can impact the glue, warp pages, and particularly for some of our special collections where you know these are sensitive materials. The safest bet in terms of protecting that material is natural attenuation and not any type of intervention. I do encourage you to check out a resource provided by the Northeast Document Conservation Center. Uh, they have uh, participated in a webinar that we offered last month and Bex Caswell Olson, who is the Director of Book Conservation, um, talked about some of the work that she had done in terms of testing out how liquid disinfection works on materials, uh, as well as the impact of heat on, on books and other documents within their collection. Uh, we also have posted in the chat a link to a pamphlet that they have created uh, in order to talk a little bit more about disinfection. So I just noticed a question come through um, about does having patrons use masks when interacting with the materials have an impact? And that goes, we really don't know, right? That, that issue of not knowing how many virus cells a person may leave behind, but certainly it adds a layer of protection um, in terms of transmission. It is, um, it is a prudent step to take, um, and we have some organizations that we've been talking to that, you know, staff, they, they quarantine items. If some libraries and organizations are doing that, they quarantine items that were outside the building for a longer period of time than those that have just been handled inside the building because they know everybody inside has been wearing a mask, and so they, consider the risk of transmission very low. Um, so it, it can definitely have a, an impact. Um, there's also a question about the usage of gloves. And this, I think, is, is, as, um, is one that we haven't heard as much about people using. But in terms of handling, I think one of the biggest things that we do know is that the safely using gloves is an important consideration. So handling materials and then properly removing and disposing of those gloves before doing anything else that might bring you in contact with things. The gloves are only going to be as effective um, as the person using them um, can make them. So it's, it's a matter of following really safe protocols around the handling of those gloves, but it can certainly prevent spread in the same way that washing hands effectively could. So break down a little bit of the lab testing that's been going on and explain some of the, um, the processes behind the testing and how we're looking at this process. A total of six tests have been conducted and all of those have been published with the sixth test just released last week. And those who have been following the project research uh, may know that there are two types of tests 
uh, that are commonly used right now with uh, detecting SARS-CoV-2. One is a test that detects the presence of viral matter but does not distinguish between active or inactive particles. So it could just be a piece of a cell that had died. They don't know. Um, the other is focusing on measuring infectious viral particles only. And the Patel research for the Realm project is using that method. So when we talk about cells, we are always talking about an infectious cell. It is capable of causing infection. So the research, again, is both iterative and cumulative, uh, with findings from earlier tests informing successive testing. So there continue to be refinements and shifts to our understanding over the course of the project. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what testing looks like. Um, as I mentioned, we've completed six tests. There will be a total of 10 rounds um, as the project is currently designed. And we test five materials in each round. And what the lab does, we have gotten materials donated to the project from organizations that are part of the steering committee and working groups um, here in the United States. So those include the Library of Congress, several public libraries, um, the National Archives and Records Administration. So they are sending us, in many cases, items directly out of their collection. So they don't get disinfected first. Um, they are, we check to make sure that they aren't already contaminated um, with virus, but they are treated like a regular item out of the collection when appropriate. So the lab gets those materials and they cut them down into rectangular coupons and put drops of infectious virus uh, into, onto the material using a fake spit or a synthetic saliva. And then the Battelle scientists put those test coupons in either a stacked or unstacked configuration. So a stacked configuration would have the material um, with another piece of like material on top of it to simulate stacking. And that stacking could be in a book drop. It could be horizontally on a bookshelf or vertically on a bookshelf. The key is that there are two items stacked against each other, preventing access to airflow, light, um, anything like that. Um, the temperature and humidity is maintained at a constant level in the test chamber. And then at each selected time point, of which there are four. So with each test, we have to select a total of four time points to measure how much virus is left. And they look to see if we, um, what the drop, the attenuation rate has been. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, how much virus we're starting with and a couple of key uh, terms that you're going to hear as we go through the results. The first is um, the starting virus amount. Um, this, we use a scientific value at, with Battelle and that is a five log um, of virus, which roughly equates to 100,000 virus particles, so virus cells. There are two key things that we're looking at. The first is the limit of quantitation. So if we start off with roughly 100,000 virus particles um, applied in each droplet and goes on to the material, once the virus count is below 26, it has dropped below what is called the limit of quantitation. And at this point, Battelle cannot see anything using their automated testing system, and instead they have to look manually using a microscope. And below the limit of quantitation, the researchers are doing a qualitative assessment where they're just looking and saying, yes, virus cells are here, or no, they aren't. Um, when we get to the point that all of the test coupons, because there are five for each item on each day, when all five of the test coupons for that day don't have any virus cells on them, then we've reached below the limit of detection. 
and will make a little bit more sense when we look at um, a chart in just a few slides. So this is an example of the materials being processed in the Battelle labs. Um, the middle image, they're actually applying the virus uh, via the synthetic saliva. And then the image on the right, uh, that books have been stacked, the materials have been stacked to simulate uh, being in a book drop or on a shelf. So this is, these are the results of the first test that we conducted. Uh, and you can see the virus count was well above 100,000. The log scale is on the left of the screen and the raw value scale is on the right. So the raw value scale makes a little bit more sense for those of us who don't have a deep science background. Um, but from, for scientific purposes, we always include the log scale as well. So what you are looking at is unstacked library materials. And um, so when it is applied, um, it was at 5.4 log, I think. And then we let the material dry. And that takes approximately one hour. And in just one hour, it went from well over 100,000 cells to around 20,000, all the way down to almost 100 for the plain paper pages. So there was a huge range in, in a drop just with allowing one hour of drying time. And then that red dotted line is that limit of quantitation, roughly 26 cells. And then by day three, there was no virus on any of the items. After doing that test, that was test one, we did test four and stacked all of the materials. And the key thing here is that we saw the rate of attenuation really take much longer. Remember, in the same items in test one, the virus was all gone by day three. But once we stacked the materials, preventing access to light or air, it took much longer. And in fact, with all of the items, we didn't get to completely below the limit of detection um, on all five, um, but only the hardcover book, which is made of a buckram cloth material, still had above the limit of quantitation. So there were closer to about 80 cells still on that material. This is just a graphic showing some of those differences between the stacked and the unstacked materials. We went out again past day six for all of these. Um, and that really was an impact of stacking. So it, it's a true takeaway from the research that it does have an impact to not allow things to access um, the air or or light, but this is also not necessarily practical in many of our facilities. Um, if, it, if it works, it's great, but um, the numbers are also quite low, and this is difficult to, to quantify, but you're really looking at, again, below 26 cells for most of these items in a dot. Um, we don't know the infection rate, but we do know that it's not as likely to come from these fomites or infected objects and looking at the long-term um, attenuation rate is an important aspect of making your own local decisions. I think for this group, um, one of the things that was particularly interesting to us, we did a test um, on leather book binding, and this, came, this was a book that was um, from the 1860s, a leather item. It was provided by private donation. Um, the Battelle scientists are pretty sure it's the oldest thing that they have tested. Uh, and what we saw was that leather, which is this blue line, um, really did, uh, it held on to the virus quite a bit longer. It was below the limit of quantitation, but not, we did not get to the limit of detection. Uh, so it's, um, and you'll notice one of the things that's different here in the previous test, we went out to day six, but in this test, we changed the test dates and went out to day eight, and we still weren't able to get below the limit of detection um, for these items. And these were all an unstacked uh, formation. So these items were not stacked in this test. Um, a lot of the other materials 
you'll notice that the chart looks quite a bit different. Um, these were fabrics uh, and leather book binding, and we saw quite a few issues with the fabric. We think that there was, there was some cytotoxicity. The cells were dying off um, as a result of the testing, um, and that could be a dye that's in the material. So uh, what we saw with like uh, upholstery for chairs, um, there may have been dye in the material that caused the cells to die or a flame retardant. We had looked to see how likely it was for those things to cause impact, and we weren't expecting it, but we got it nonetheless. All right, let's go through a few more slides, and then we'll save some time for questions and answers. So this is a complete list of all of the items that have been tested, and these charts are all available on the Realm website. You can download them. They're published under a Creative Commons license, so you can make those available. Um, you can use them in your own discussions, and uh, you can see um, all the items that have been tested to date. Um, vellum was asked in the chat, and that was not one of the items that we have tested so far. We have a list of about 130 items across the archives, libraries, and museums community that are of interest to be tested, um, but we haven't been able to get to all of them just yet. <laughs> all right, so for more information, uh, we do encourage you to check out the project website. Uh, we've been posting links in the chat uh, the toolkit resources that are there, you know, include ways to help you talk with your local decision makers or constituents. That um, all of the test results have been published. There's a great list of frequently asked questions. You also have the opportunity to submit a question to the project team. So if we don't answer something today, um, you can always submit something in the future. Uh, and we encourage you to use that submission form. And you can also sign up for email updates. So whenever we put out a new release of information or resources from the project, we send out an email update to those subscribers, and you're welcome to do that uh, and keep in touch with what's happening with the project. All right. Thank you, Kendra. There's so much wonderful information that you shared. Um, and so I just wanted to get to one of the questions that has come in through chat. Uh, so Jessica Kirk is asking, how was it determined how many virus particles to start with for the study? That's a good question. So we worked with the scientists at Battelle who just determined that it was a realistic amount for a highly infectious sneeze or cough to be able to transfer that much virus. But it is a bit of an estimate. It's definitely an estimation because we don't know, right? We don't know the range of uh, potential infection levels. So it makes a big difference um, by the individual. So they really had to choose uh, an, an amount that they felt represented um, a realistic, highly infectious sneeze. Thanks. That's uh, it's really helpful to know uh, what kinds of information informed um, informed that. And so, what other question has come in here? Um, see, what is the risk table? What is sorry, I'm trying. What is the risk table time that's necessary to add to the laboratory results? I'm see if I have interpreted that correctly. Yeah, I'm not sure on that one. Um, Paula, if you could provide some a few additional details, we'll try and come back to that answer because I'm not certain. <laughs> okay. okay, and then for unstacked materials, was the virus placed on outer surfaces only? It was placed, so if we took a piece of paper, we applied the virus, and then we placed another piece of paper on top of it, and then removed it to record the attenuation or the drop. So it was material, virus, material. Okay, great, thanks for, thanks for explaining that. Um, and I was thinking in terms of our audience today, uh, one specific item that I know has been tested that might be of interest are archival folders. So I don't know if either you could uh, 
uh, flip back to the slide that has all of the materials and maybe just quickly review uh, what the time what the time mm -hmm. was for the archival folders. Yeah, the archival folders were provided um, from the National Archives and Records Administration. So these are a buffered type of paper that have a specific, specific pH. And uh, what we found, and those were stacked very similar to the way that you would find them in archives, and that fully attenuated uh, within two days. And that's one, right, where the pH is more well known for that material because it's specific to uh, preservation. So it's possible that something like pH makes a difference in how long the virus can survive. Yeah, so that, thank you. That's, that's really helpful to know about the archival folders and, and the materials and, and how those might interact with the virus. And I see, um, as you're, I'm sure, seeing as well, as Paula is adding a little clarification, I think ultimately there's a question again about how to think about the actual results and how to think about quarantine time. And I know that you spoke to this already, Kendra, uh, earlier in the presentation, but maybe just worth reiterating um, you know, how, how these are intended to be one input uh, to think about decisions like quarantine. Mm -hmm. And, I sh you know, Paula, you're right, is that this is a controlled environment, which is really necessary due to the dangerous nature of handling COVID-19. You know, the Patel labs do this in a biosafety level three laboratory. They wear safety hoods and lots of personal protective equipment while they're working with it. So it is designed to mimic, you know, an, a standard office space, you know, the temperatures that are used and the humidity, but that varies so greatly around the world. And even within the United States, um, you know, a lot of places may have a Fahrenheit temperature year round between 70 and 80 degrees and other places um, could fluctuate greatly from below freezing to above 100 degrees um, throughout the year. So it is a very controlled situation uh, which can make it um, difficult to relate to real world, um, but we're also trying to work within the confines of safety and practicality. And in terms of how many days you have to add, the other thing to take into account, and, and one of the suggestions that we've had for people is, is to take the results of the realm research, share it with a local health department or health authority, whatever um, organization is responsible for community or public health and talk to them about the results and ask them to help you interpret the best way to apply policies and procedures based on, on their understanding of spread in your community, likelihood of um, transmission. If you have a very low infection rate, it may really impact how long you choose to quarantine materials if you want to do that. So there are just a tremendous number of variables. Thank you, and, and again, that recommendation to consult with a public health, a local public health official is, is a really useful one. And then another question has come in uh, regarding the one of the materials tested. Did all of the leather tested come from the same binding or were more than one type or source of leather tested? It, it was a single book, um, circa 1860, so one item that was tested. Great. Well, thanks for clarifying that. And we have um, just a couple minutes left. Um, Kendra is available. If there are any other questions, um, she could take a few more. And if not, then again, there are, uh, let's see. I do see, did any of the books or paper use rag paper, or would you know whether they were all machine made? Wow, uh, that is a new one. I haven't, I haven't heard it. So um, I would say 
my guess is that most of it would be machine made paper, so not any um, older. I think most of the books that we tested were published after um, 1980, for sure, when I looked at some of the materials um, that were pulled out of the collections. Um, but that is that is an interesting question. I know we, we do have um, different types of paper on the list of things that could potentially be tested, but these were strictly out of um, the published books. So, but I'll... I'll it's the first time I've gotten that. Yeah, well, <laughs> well there's, there's always a first time for everything, and certainly with, with this group, I'm so excited to, to get your input on that. And again, going to the project website, uh, there is uh, an option there to contact the project team, questions, suggestions, and uh, these kinds of questions about, are you considering these materials, and specifically certain types of materials, uh, that is certainly one way to get these over to the project team, but obviously Kendra has noted these questions today. Um, and did you see, um, well, um, and we may even have some folks who might donate some materials. It, it's, um, getting, I'm getting some indication of that. Um, so again, thanks for these great questions. And Kendra, maybe we'll just have a look and see if we've covered everything that's come through. Um, yeah. There is a question about airflow and ventilation during the test, and there was none. So it, in the test chamber, the materials don't have access to light, and they don't uh, have, there's no air flowing over the materials, so it's a very controlled environment. Okay, great. Well, um, I think that just about almost takes us to time. Uh, so, Kendra, thank you so much for sharing um, all of the um, work and the research that the project has been doing and will continue doing. And so, again, uh, just a plug to uh, sign up for the email list to get updates, uh, go to the project website because so many resources, uh, test results um, are available there and will continue to be shared there. Um, I also want to thank uh, Marion and Shayla for their time today. And to all of our attendees, thank you for your excellent uh, participation and questions. Um, we've uh, have Kendra um, <laughs> to uh, stump her a bit, and so she'll she'll look into uh, a little bit more of the materials. So um, thanks for those great questions. We really appreciate um, the participation. We will post a recording of this webinar online, and I'll notify you by email when that is available. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for all of your work that you are doing to support your libraries, your communities. Um, we know it's, uh, it can be tough times, and we appreciate all of your work with that. And today concludes, and this concludes today's webinar. Thank you all very much.